Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Joffrey Golzar. I'm an interventional cardiologist, endovascular specialist out of Chicago, um, also chief medical officer for Avenger. Uh, this is our uh, second uh, webinar that we've done at Avenger. We've uh, dedicated to uh, education and continuing education. And we've uh, traditionally had on-site, in-person educational symposia throughout the year. And obviously, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we were uh, forced to close those down, but we wanted to continue the educational process. And so we decided to move forward with the webinars. We've had great response to that. And we really appreciate everybody um, being on uh, this webinar today. Our first one was a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Tom Davis, a phenomenal webinar. And you can uh, get the recaps of that and the video recording uh, of that. Uh, uh, online and today we have Dr. Schwartzberg uh, and Dr. Cowich. So just a couple of ho housekeeping um, issues we wanted to discuss. Everybody's going to be muted. So at the end of the uh, the conference, the Dr. Uh, Schwartzberg presentation, we'll go through questions and we realized last time we, we had so many great questions. We had about 40 questions that came in, 45 questions. So we spent a lot of time in the Q&A and the discussion type uh, part of uh, the webinar, and so we're going to do that as well and open it up quite a bit. Feel free to uh, to submit questions during the talk as you think about it, and we'll be able to pull those up later and have a Q and A session. Uh, Dr. Uh, Schwartzberg is our uh, our speaker for today. Um, he's going to be doing an overview of safety challenges when treating femoral popliteal disease. Show a case study. Uh, he'll have some conclusions and his thoughts, and um, then we'll go to the Q and A session. Next slide. So uh, Dr. Cowich is gonna be on the panel with me today. Dr. Cow Cowich is a interventional cardiologist and premier endovascular specialist from my alma mater, University of Arkansas. Uh, went to University of Arkansas Medical School. Uh, that's where I went to med school as well. So we have a lot in common. He's a great friend of mine and uh, really an incredible operator. Um, and uh, next slide. And our uh, highlight today is the great Dr. Glenn Schwartzberg. He's a vascular surgeon, great friend as well. Um, he uh, did his general surgery at Tulane and then vascular cell, uh, fellowship at uh, New England Deaconess. And uh, has been in private practice in Baton Rouge since 1986. He's chief of surgery there. It was great to really have a vascular surgeon um, speaking uh, today because Obviously, we think of surgeons as, as cutters and, and you know, preferring bypass surgery, but he's really led the field in endovascular intervention and, and uh, image-guided therapy as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to my good friend, Dr. Glenn Schwartzberg. Thank, Thank you, Glenn. John. Thank you, Joffer. Um, also, just kind of a, a clerical um, point, uh, it's actually FACS, it's not FACC. I'm not smart enough to be a cardiologist, so... Just, just so everybody doesn't think I'm trying to masquerade as something else. Um, and thanks for this opportunity. Thanks to Avenger for giving me this opportunity to, to talk about um, the process of how I approach things and, and we'll get into why I do it and sort of what was my turning point. So first I'd like to just talk, this is a case, it's a 73-year-old male. He had Rutherford three classification, coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension. He stopped smoking about 10 years ago, but had severe claudication and was really limited in his lifestyle. And so you can see that angiogram that shows an SFA occlusion with dist distal reconstitution. And he had two vessel runoff via the perineal and posterior tibial arteries. So um, I usually will approach these things from sticking the contralateral side, which I did, and put a seven French sheath up and over, and then <clears throat> use the ocelot to, to cross the lesion. And at the distal cap, or just maybe a centimeter or so before the distal cap, it was really fibrotic and calcified, and that caused me, or in, in my working at the ocelot, I, I went into a sub um, intimal plane or in, into the media and uh, tried to redirect, could not redirect, so therefore used a reentry tool. And in this case, I used the end tier um, and was able to reenter and then uh, ad advance the catheter, uh, quit, uh, trailblazer catheter, as you can see, verified that I was interluminal. And um, this, this case was done at an OBL. I, I'm not a participant in OBL, but I have a relationship 
with a group of cardiologists in here in Baton Rouge. And when they uh, have patients that they've sent to me, I'm willing to do that at their facility, which I did. So it took a little while to cross and then re-enter. And so I was a little bit concerned about um, my, the treatment time. Um, so therefore I used uh, an atherectomy device that was non-imaging. And the problem was uh, at the distal point where I re-entered, because again, I knew I was gonna be subintimal, but I didn't consider where, the way I was making cuts. And that's the result that you can see is that there's a perforation and an AV fistula from that. So the next you know, treatment or the next maneuver that I was taught was you put a balloon up and try to tamponade, which I did for a couple of minutes let the balloon down, and then the whole thing was occluded. Probably because I was ballooning in the subintimal space, it created a shift in the plaque, and then the whole thing was occluded. Thank thankfully, I still had uh, a wire, and I always use an embolic protection device, and had a spider wire distally. I then resorted to using the pantheris, and with the pantheris, I could see the dissection window in the film of the dissection plane, I was able to cut out the dissection plane to restore flow and, um, and therefore maintain patency of the artery. And the, the gentleman did fine, but to me, this was sort of uh, an aha moment. Uh, this was about maybe two years ago. <clears throat> and there have been significant improvements that were made in the, um, the A250, so it's now the A400. And um, that basically has become my workhorse catheter. Uh, Ian, just real quick, what do you think about uh, treating dissections with uh, atherectomy? Because some people kind of uh, shy away from that. I think that most people have shied away from it because you know, they're concerned that you don't know what you're treating. But this is, you know, imaging guided atherectomy is the perfect model for this because you can actually see the dissection flap. You can actually see what you're wanting to cut. And you can actually, especially now with the, with the new catheter, you can actually cut out the dissection flaps. So that's something that we've, you know, we've embraced and that we've actually, one of the big benefits of using the OCT-guided atherectomy, of using the Panteras, is you actually can see, you know, what you want to cut. So a lot of times after you do uh, just uh, directional atherectomy without image guidance, and you see these long streaks in your angiogram, those are flaps that are left of atheroma. So you can actually, is when you have when you have OCT guided imaging, you can actually when you see those, you can go back in with the device and you can actually cut those out. So I think for especially for like in in what Glenn's pointing out here as far as safety, that you know he went subintimal and re-entered. These patients, you know, if you just do balloon angioplasty, you know they'll reach the nose, they'll reach the nose, they'll occlude again. But especially with uh, image-guided atherectomy, you can go in and cut that dissection flap and cut back into the true lumen, so your patency, you know, would would last longer. So I think, and not there wouldn't be a need to have to stent, you know, in a long segment where the dissection is. So I think it's and, a perfect example. That's exact, and, and that's exactly it. That that with the use of the image-guided modality, uh, I think I can prevent the use of other adjuvant treatments and the, the decrease the use of stenting. And if you don't violate the media, don't violate the, the subadventitia, there's no reason to use a DCB if you get a good, you know, less than uh, 30, 20, 30% residual stenosis, which you should be able to do safely with, with imaging in my mind. And the other thing that this brought up to me also was thinking about the, at, at uh, the job for the CVC meeting when Tom Davis showed his um, picture of um, he had crossed with a wire and catheter and then used a, a, a rotational atherectomy device. The patient came back with this huge pseudoaneurysm and uh, AV fistula there afterwards. And to me, it just it coincides and, it's, and, it, and it reinforces the fact that um, if, if a device is used that is non-imaging and you don't know where you are in using it, there's a chance that their harm can be done to the patient. Um, so, um, with regard to cha the challenges of using, uh, treating CTOs, um, every, everybody that's on this call has dealt with these, I'm sure, the perforation, distal embolization, 
the pseudoaneurysm, aortic fistula thrombosis, second. Again, in my mind, this is the absolute reason that image-guided uh, treatment is, is my workhorse and my choice to go with to try to prevent many of these problems. With regard to distal embolization, I use an embolic protection device on every case, <clears throat> unless the distal point of treatment will not allow me to keep an embolic protection device in, like if I'm going down to the distal AT or dorsal pedal where I can't park a, a spider wire down there. And the reason for that is because of the literature that supports the, the fact that there are, is significant macroembolization that occurs, and then there's microembolization. So with microembolization, when you include the, the, capillary, the, the arterioles and the capillary outflow, it may not show up on the, on the films that you're showing, but long term, it can create significant problems with patency because of increased cross-sectional, or reduced cross-sectional area and increased resistance to flow. All these things have to be at your ready disposal when you're treating CTOs. Uh, some people use wire and catheter, some people use crossing devices, the re-entry tools, uh, the two that I like are the Intier and the Pioneer, um, and then the OCT guided CTO crossing catheter, and in this case, it's, this is the Ocelot. When I see a CTO, I don't even attempt to cross it with wire and catheter. I go straight to an image guided modality. And I know there are many people that use wire and catheter and that's their skill set and they're capable and functional of doing that. My um, bias is, again, I don't know where I am uh, because the wire is going to take the path of least resistance, which many times will be a subintimal plane. <clears throat> With regard to treatment modalities, um, angioplasty, all these things have their limitations because of the, the injury uh, phenomena that occurs and the injury model that occurs after indiscriminately treating uh, the artery. And what I mean by indiscriminate treatment is if only the plaque is treated, that's a good technical result and probably a good long-term result. However, if the normal artery is injured because of not being able to visualize where you are and what, what is being done, then that's a setup in my mind and, and based on science with recurrent disease, neoantimal hyperplasia, et cetera. Um, and so I picked to use the Pantheris because of the science that backs up the fact that if you can avoid the medial disruption in the subadventitial plane, sub -adventitial plane, then you're more likely to not induce neoantimal hyperplasia and recurrent stenosis. And um, one of the guys that I enjoy reading and learned a lot from reading his articles is Alan Dardick uh, from Yale. And he has very eloquently displayed this with uh, the, with experimental models, as well as just mapping the, the, the biochemical pathways of how this develops. Um, there have been numerous studies that show that if you uh, injure the advent tissue, if you disrupt it, that the, in, the degree of recurrent disease is significant, um, and you'll have to deal with that later on down the line. The other thing that I've found is in patients that I've previously treated with non-image guided atherectomy and then had to go back because of a recurrent stenosis, it's very uh, educational to look at the swaths of media that are no longer there. Because as you cut the neoantimal hyperplastic tissue, you'll come to an area where you've cut all the neoantimal hyperplasia out and all of a sudden you're to the adventitia. So there's no media there because it's been removed from previous interventions. Uh, this is from the vision trial, and this was uh, Tom Davis and, and Joffrey talked about this before. And, it, and again, it just reinforces the same premise that if you can avoid um, injuring something that doesn't need to be interacted with, then the, the long-term results are going to be much better. So. Um, this is uh, image, imaging of uh, the Pantheris cutting. And so you can see 
the labeling of the media, the adventitia, and um, cuts are being made. And when you see all four bars like that, that means you're protected, that you're not gonna cut anything. Um, this is the cutter being engaged. Um, there are three bars. Uh, the, right now, the middle marker is around the seven, six or seven o'clock. And you can see out to the outside, just beyond that, the adventitial, the, the marker of the media, adventitia. And it's like a honeycomb, a very fluffy, flowery, look, uh, streaky looking uh, modality. And that's what you want to avoid. And so when I do this, I'm looking from the inside out. I look for the media because that's what you want to avoid. That's what you do not want to injure. Uh, and so you as you rotate the device around, you can get a good appreciation for the burden of plaque where it is. And as, as, as I cut, I can follow the plaque around and make sure that I don't avoid, uh, that I don't injure the media. And so long as I can stay in that um, location, then I know I'll, I'll be safe with things. Um, these are the two devices, uh, the, the Pantheris and the Pantheris SV. So the Pantheris um, is a, a cutter that is used to treat vessels from four, uh, anywhere from three to seven, but I use it really maybe four to six um, uh, size range. The cutting uh, device is opposed into the plaque by that apposition balloon. And sometimes that apposition balloon can create a little bit of a problem in cutting in a very calcified vessel because it can create some drag. So you just have to be aware of that and realize that if you're having some trouble advancing the catheter, you just need a little, a little pressure off the balloon and you'll be able to visualize well and continue to, to cut easily. Rather than the balloon on the six French device, the SV device, there's a jog and that jog as you open, as one opens the cutter, the jog becomes more accentuated to give you more um, positioning into the plaque. So it becomes more aggressive. Um, it, one of the things that I learned with using the SV device is I really have to take into account that jog when I'm going up and over the aortic bifurcation and or when using it to cannulate the anterior tibial where there's any kind of angulation. So you just wanna go with the jog not against the jog because it, it can create damage to the vessel, if, or some damage to the device if you go against the jog. So um, this is a patient that I treated, uh, 78 years old, he had non-healing ulcer of this great toe. He had CLI, uh, Rutherford 4, heavy smoker, had significant COPD, and I really did not want to operate on him because I was concerned about his pulmonary function. And so he has a flush occlusion of the SFA with a, an isolated popliteal artery segment that reconstitutes and then signal vessel runoff via the perineal. And you can see in the, in the just below the tibial perineal trunk, there's a pretty significant stenosis in the perineal uh, right before its origin. So I used the ocelot to cross uh, and I was able to, taking a steep uh, LAO oblique view, I could see the origin of the SFA and was able to engage it with the ocelot. Um, and so um, the ocelot has three speeds, um, 35, 45, and 60. And at the top speed, it, it will evolve much quicker than this. And so this is an example of the ocelot crossing. And you can see what happened is I got into a subintimal plane. And you can see that honeycomb pattern about 3 o'clock, um, which is the adventitia. And so I knew I was in the wrong place. So I pulled back and redirected. And so now you can see media all the way around. Um, and that again shows I'm in the wrong place because that just means the media is wrapping around the catheter. And sometimes that will happen with very calcified vessels. The thing is when you see adventitia, like you see now at the three o'clock position, you're in the wrong place because you, it'll end up perforating the vessel if you continue in that plane. So the, the technique is to put the middle marker on the adventitia to try to redirect or stop, pull back and try to redirect. I tried all those tricks. However, once a false passage is made, it's very difficult to guide around that. So I pulled the catheter out, went down with a trailblazer catheter and a glide wire, and I was able to cross um, through the proximal occlusion up to the isolated popliteal artery segment 
it was able then to re-enter the popliteal artery segment with the glide wire, put an 014 wire, exchange for an 014 wire back down, and then put the ocelot back down and cross successfully into that distal popliteal artery occlusion using, using the ocelot. Then put a spider wire down um, the, uh, uh, the uh, perineal, and then use the, um, the pantheris to, to cut. So I, I started, I will usually start when there's a multi-level disease, I will usually start distally first because there's better visualization because there's no blood flow. And so the OCT image is much crisper. And so I use a six French device distally first to treat the tibial perineal trunk disease, the perineal disease, and then use it some in the popliteal, but again, it can only go up to about a four millimeter vessel and then trade it out for the seven French uh, device uh, and continue to cut. And so here's an example of the, of the cutting uh, with the um, seven French device. And so again, once I see the, the media, which is that dark band, um, I stop um, and then close the cutter. There's the morphology showing the calcium and the severe calcification in the plaque. Uh, and many times what, what will happen is as I advance the catheter and I come up to the, uh, to the media and I see the media, um, I'll try to redirect around that to follow the plaque to continue to go down and not just part off at that point. So I think this is an example of that coming up where I saw it and I just, I didn't close the device, I just rotated it around to continue to cut distally. And the reason I do that is because I feel like if I part off each time, I'm gonna miss an area of plaque at its inception or at the most proximal part. So if I can continue to follow it around and from a safety profile, I, I know I can see where the media is, so I know I'm only cutting plaque. And there is the potential for embolization by not parting off and not closing the cutter However, I feel very confident because of the fact that I have an embolic protection device distally that I can do that and therefore get cleaner cuts. So it's almost like a spiral cut in the, um, in the plaque. So this was, uh, um, these are completion films um, and before and after. And the guy's ulcer is healing well. I saw him in the office uh, earlier this week. Um, and uh, he no longer has rest pain and his ulcer is healing up and uh, he's doing well. And so <clears throat> that's the plaque. And so you can see the, the mixed morphology of the plaque. There's significant calcification there. There's some thrombus. There's a, it's, it's lipid laden. Um, and um, it was successful using different modalities. And you just have to keep an open, I think, or what I do is I use a, keep an open mind of not being sold on just one approach, but realize that I may have to maneuver around based on the patient's underlying pathology. Um, as far as tips and tricks that I use, because I use the embolic protection device, the spider wire, I worry about distal migration. And the way I've gotten around that is, you can see in this picture, the pantheris going in, it's rapid exchange, so the wire, 014 wires down, and then I bring a torque device up to the, um, the hemostatic valve of the seven French sheath and clamp it down there so that I know, even though if I'm pushing with the device to get through some calcified area or something that's tough to cut, that um, the spider wire is not gonna migrate distally because it's, it's secured by the torque device against the sheath. The other thing that I found in treating uh, severe calcification, sometimes there's difficulty advancing the catheter because again of the drag of the, of, the, of the apposition balloon, but also because of the morphology and the geometry of the plaque. Because if there's this large bulky ledge that's sticking out into the lumen, the device can sometimes get caught on that and it's very difficult to cut through that. So what I do is when, I, when, I engage, when that happens to me, I'll engage the plaque distally and it's almost like undercutting a ledge. So as I undercut it and keep working distal to proximal, then there's only a thin layer of the ledge left and it's more likely that the device will cut through that. So in conclusion, um, the, the, 
these are my kind of takeaways that it's essential to preserve the media and not violate the sub adventitial space. And, the, and I think that that will uh, result in a reduction in neoentomal hyperplasia and enhanced safety can be achieved using image guided devices and therapies. OCT guided technologies can be used in all plaque morphologies. They can be used in calcium, soft plaque, it doesn't make any difference. I use these uh, when I have vein graft stenoses. 30 to 40% of patients that have bypass grafts will develop a vein graft stenosis. And I feel it's very confident and safe using this in a vein graft because I can see where the media is and I make sure that I don't perforate that. It's essential, or to me it's essential and very advantageous to use OCT and endovascular imaging in what I call hostile arteri arterial territories. The number of people that have prosthetic knees that create significant difficulty visualizing the arterial anatomy because of, of the knee prosthesis, I don't have to worry about imaging or taking shots because I can see where I'm going with the OCT technology. Um, and it also limits the radiation exposure and the contrast value. The preparation time for Pinta, I've heard this many times, that people say it takes too long to set up. It takes about a minute and a half at most. Uh, when I do, when I use it, the, the, it, the catheter is the um, catheter is in the room, the IV tubing's on the back table, it takes literally a minute and a half to get it set up and it takes longer to set up in my mind the um, the material for the uh, diamond back the the the, the uh, lubricant for diamond back and then finally a safe therapeutic endovascular treatment option i think will reduce the use of adjuvant treatment reduce the amount of stenting the use of uh, balloon angioplasty um, and the result and end up with greater long-term results Excellent. Thank you so much, Glenn. What an uh, eloquent presentation. Um, really great review of, uh, of that case and using uh, OCT technology for crossing and, and treatment. Um, uh, before we go to questions, as I mentioned before, and I'll mention again, everybody is muted, but if you have any questions, whether it be about OCT technology or just anything endovascular in general, uh, please uh, feel free to get on the chat or the Q&A and ask questions um, as we're discussing as well. Uh, before we get to that, uh, I do want to give credit to, to our amazing team that has uh, worked so hard to put this together and continues to work hard on not only current technologies, future technologies, Gabriel Rubo, um, who's really took the lead on this and did these awesome animations that you see on our OCT, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do, Kara Parker-Smith, as well as Jeff Monroe, um, uh, who really put a lot of hard work into this. So uh, just kind of starting to open up to some discussion. Ian, you know, I get a lot of, uh, you know, frequently we hear this question uh, or the, a comment to say, you know what, I can cross nine out of 10 CTOs with a wire and catheter. Why do I need Ocelot? How do you answer that? Nine out of 10, you mean 10 out of 10, Jeffrey? You know, Not me, say, other say, they, they right. never fail. <laughs> right, no, never fails, right. So, so one of the things I learned, and especially that I became, I would say I became dependent on Ocelot the more I used it, because the imaging, the knowing of what Glenn pointed out, the knowing of where you are at all times, knowing, you know, when Glenn showed that flush SFA occlusion, I've seen, I've been for where you see a little strand or you're not sure and you push that catheter in and you know immediately if you're in a heavily diseased SFA, you can tell that the, it's a large, you know, six millimeter SFA. Whereas when you push a wire and you're trying to gauge, is it a tight loop? Is it a big loop? You know, I don't know if I'm in a branch, you know, or I've seen little strands that I say, I bet you that's the SFA. And they're like, no, that's just a little collateral. And you put it in and you see it's a huge vessel. So the, that's, that initial information telling you you're, in, you're starting off in the right place. You know, you, when you push that catheter in across the proximal cap and you see that you're in, lumen, in the lumen of the proximal cap, you know, once you cross that proximal cap, you know that the rest of it, you know, is going to be softer because it's always the caps that are the hardest. So just so, being able to tell where you are in the beginning is tremendous. You're starting off, you know, your success rate is going to be so much higher. As you advance, you know, and you know exactly whether you're in the lumen or where's not the lumen, 
you know, you get to the point where you can meet a little bit of resistance with the catheter. And at that point, you know, I can push harder because I know that I'm still staying in the lumen. Or you could take your wire and if it's heavily calcified, probe with the wire and then advance the catheter over it and know where that you're still in the lumen. In my experience, if you can cross, and most of the times where, where I've had problems with the catheter is at the very distal cap, at the very end. Mm -hmm. That one, you know, that one centimeter, you know, half a centimeter where you just, you know you're luminal, but you just can't get into it. You know what, you've taken a 20, 30 centimeter CTO, you've made it into now a one centimeter CTO. And now you just have to work on crossing that one little spot. So to me, your success rate is tremendously going to be higher. And you know, the other thing that I've learned from, from looking at the OCT loops as I go through it, you learn the morphology of what the CTO is. And so many times there's thrombus in there. Um, and if you then try, if you cross a CTO and then use a non-image treatment option, the embolization rate's going to be higher. And, and so what I've learned is by when I see the thrombus burden, I'll put down an, a, a penumbra or something else to be able to clear out the thrombus. And then it gives you a better, de, better delineation of what you really need to treat. And I, I'm somewhat biased because as a surgeon, you know, I, I look on the inside of the arteries. I know what they look like. And I would never, ever consider doing an operation without wearing my operating loops because it enhances my visualization. So I kind of apply that to endovascular technologies. Why would I possibly want to treat somebody in an endovascular modality and not see what I'm doing and just try to do it blindly? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, think it's OCT, uh, you know, using OCT, I think we all, we believe, um, obviously, that uh, not damaging normal tissue is so important with patency. And that's been shown and it's been proven as well. And, you know, there's so many times that my fellows, you know, we're, let's say if we loop a wire and you know, we try to cross, my fellows say, well, are, are you subintimal or not? Are you subintimal or not? You don't know. You don't, most of the time you're kind of in and out subintimal planes. Right. There's really very rarely you would know unless you throw an IVIS in there and look at it um, that you would know if you're actually true lumen or not. And once you go outside of that vessel, once you start disrupting that normal architecture of the vessel, you start getting into issues with uh, restenosis. And as you guys, uh, I know uh, Ian and Glenn, you guys know that we're working on uh, the next generation oscillaris. Um, mm -hmm. It comes from the brilliant mind of our chief technology officer, Himanshu Patel. Uh, who's done a phenomenal job. It's not available in the U.S. right now. Uh, it's uh, CE Mark, and we're going to be in uh, Europe um, in, a couple, in a, about a month or so uh, with our uh, initial uh, cases for that, or follow-up cases. We did some initial cases, but this hopefully will be available uh, at the end of the year, but it's going to be same type of concept of being able to use OCT imaging but a really powerful catheter that has a much more aggressive tip. It spins at uh, between a 600 and 1,000 RPMs. It has a deflectible tip. So I'm super excited about that and looking forward to getting it in, uh, in everybody's hands. But I think that's sort of that ne uh, the uh, next generation of what we're going to see in, in CTO crossing. And as you guys know, the main reason for bypass surgery as well as amputations is failure to cross CTOs. So if we can increase the the ability to cross CTOs, we can change the paradigm of how we treat vascular disease. So really excited about that. Trevor, I think, you know, one of the, one of um, Glenn's slides, you know, where the, it's very powerful, where they took a hundred patients, you know, and they did directional atherectomy on them. And 52% of those patients, 52 of those patients had adventitial tissue. And that's where 97% of the restenosis occurred is in those patients. So that's a very powerful message saying if you damage, you know, the, the structure of the artery, that is where your restenosis comes from. Yeah. So if you can safely cut, you know, you're, you know, we saw in vision, you know, the restenosis is so low. It's a very powerful message that needs to be sent. So I know both of you guys have been using the uh, SV quite a bit. It's the newest generation uh, below the knee smaller catheter uh, uh, for uh, infrapopliteal vessels treated four millimeters. Um, what has been your experience 
with what you see below the knee. Now we're kind of opening up a whole new world because there's really, there's only one study that's looked at OCT below the knee. And it was a study um, that um, uh, looked at stent sizing. And now we're seeing a whole new world of plaque morphology um, that we never knew existed because really you don't have the resolution with IVIS. So uh, we're seeing that. Uh, I'm just kind of curious what you guys have seen. Um, Ian, I'll start with you and then Glenn. You know, the, first of all, the resolution for working in a smaller vessel is tremendous. You know, you can actually see the, the adventitia very clearly. You can see the plaque very clearly. You can actually see the entire 360 circumference of the vessel, you know. So seeing that, you know, makes, makes it much more able to cut what you need to. I think, you know, what you're seeing, you know, the mixture of having all these calcium pockets, all these lipid pockets, you know, I think it's very, you know, being able to know where to cut, you know, um, for me, the, the visualization of having the SV, you know, is, is so much clearer and so much more robust than being able to treat what you can. I actually enjoy using the SV because I can see clearly and I, you know, it's nice to sit there and talk to the fellow and point out everything that, you know, you're seeing and have him point out and having me able to just see that you can actually see what you're cutting. I think one of the main points that Glenn made was that, you know, when he's cutting, that this disease is not circumferential. You know, this disease is very eccentric. So Glenn could probably speak more to that when he opens up an artery that he can see where the plaque is. It's not just circumferential plaque, but you can actually, when he's cutting and then he has to redirect the catheter on the fly, you can only do that with, with image-guided therapy. You can't do that with a fluoro, you know, because you don't know when the, when the disease crosses over. So I think it's, for me, it's, it's you know, remarkable that you can do that. I, I couldn't, I agree with you, um, Ian. And um, I will tell you that I think the other benefit of the SV device is that in going to meetings and listening to people talk, everyone was willing to treat SFA and popliteal disease but they would bail out on treating tibial disease because of the concern of if I get into trouble, what's my bailout? Uh, and I think the, the safety profile of the SV device and the fact that you can see what you're doing. And, and the other thing that it just, it opens all new avenues for you for, for treatment. I think the other thing that's really, I think is, um, so important to recognize is, particularly in the tibial vessels, there is not much media there. All of a sudden, you go from media to adventitia. So if you spin a diamond back down there or something else where you have no control over the depth of the cut, that you absolutely, that absolutely is gonna be an injury model that is set up because there is not much room to maneuver down there just because of the size of the vessel and the difference in morphology of the vessel compared to the SFA and popliteal. So to me, it's, it's made, it's emboldened me a little bit, I guess, because I have an in, improved safety profile of what I can do distally. Great, so uh, Tom Davis asked a question on total occlusions of the popliteal artery. How much do you use this to avoid geniculate branches? Oh, absolutely. I, as I said, I, if I see a CTO, I pull the ocelot. So, um, particularly with this type of patient that has a flush occlusion, or if you have a flush occlusion, as what Tom's alluding to, at a, at a large branch, if you try, if a wire and catheter is used to cross that, many times it will just go into the geniculate. You have difficulty trying to get purchase to get through the proximal cap. And so that's the benefit of, of, of using the image guided in, in my mind. And, um, and you, if by chance you enter a, a branch, you'll be able to see that because the vessel wraps around the catheter and you can see that you're in a smaller vessel than what you anticipated. And that's when you pull back and redirect. Whereas if you're just doing it blindly with wire and catheter, you're gonna keep going and perforate something. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, uh, Ian, what do you think about the learning curve? Uh, what, is, what was kind of your learning curve for Ocelot, for, uh, Pantheris, you know, Tom actually, he was kind of a mentor to me. He, he taught me quite a bit about uh, CTO crossing with Ocelot. I feel like that's probably from my standpoint, 
um, one of the largest learning curves. Me personally, I think at the, at the right for me device is a little bit easier. Um, but tell me a little bit about what, what do you feel is the learning curve when you train physicians? What do you see? So, so one of the things is, you know, starting off on this very early, we didn't have a lot of OCT knowledge. And I think that's one of the biggest differences between the physicians we're training now and physicians when we first started doing this is that physicians now have a lot of OCT training. You know, they walk in, they look at the image and they know exactly what they're looking at. So recognition is probably one of the biggest things. Um, you know, pushing the catheter, it's kind of a hands-on, you know, guys, it's not hard to do. But this was actually looked at by Avenger in, in both in, in the vision study, you know, and they saw that, you know, if, you know, at the first uh, hardest cases are the first five cases. And then once you get past the first five cases, you know, 10 cases, you know, they become much more proficient. They use less fluoroscopy. They use less contrast, especially with Ocelot. They saw this. By the time you get to 15 cases, you could sit on this panel and replace me and, Glenn, and probably you, Jeff. Probably not Glenn. But, <laughs> but yeah. But so the learning curve, you know, is, is the imaging is probably what was initially the hardest. Once you get the imaging down, you know, it's, it's relatively, you know, straightforward. Glenn, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, I would say within 10 to 15 cases, people can feel comfortable doing it. Um, and I can tell you, I, I mean, I learn something new every time I pull it out. There's something new that I see that I have to kind of put into perspective what that represents. And, and so it's really very invigorating to me because it's trying to figure it out as you go along. Um, I will tell you the thing that was the most troubling to me with Ocelot was the change in the radar sweep back and forth. And just because for me, it made me kind of lose concentration of where I was, but I've gotten used to it now. I think with Ocelaris, with being a constant, it's going to be so much better and so much easier to use. It really is. So, you know, Glenn kind of uh, mentioned a little bit about DCB, so I wanted to bring that up again. Ian, what do you do after atherectomy? So you do, you use whatever atherectomy device you choose. Um, do you just balloon? Do you DCB? Do you stent? Do you use a tax stent? What do you like to do after? So you, for the most part, I, I either balloon or use a drug coated balloon, depending on how many times, you know, if, if this is, you know, if this is a, someone that's been referred to now and this is a second attempt, I tend to use more DCBs. You know, um, we, you know, still have this controversy on how safe DCBs are. So there, there's sometimes I'm hesitant to pull a DCB for that reason. Um, but, you know, and it really depends, too, on how much debulking I can actually achieve. Um, you know, sometimes it, you can cut, you know, to the stenosis less than 30%, down to 20%. I always take an image, a tip picture, after I've done all, all the atherectomy. And then, I, you know, and then I look at and see, you know, if the vessel looks 20% residual stenosis, I would rather leave it alone than treat it with a balloon and create any barrel, barrel trauma you know, start any kind of restenosis cascade, especially if I know that all I've done is done plaque, you know, excision. I haven't really disturbed any of the adventitial portion of the vessel. So standalone atherectomy, you know, if you get great results, you know, it's, it's good, it's good enough to, you know, better than just, than using balloon. If I have to use a balloon or, you know, I'm, some, I'm still, now at this point, I'm still debating, you know, just using plain old balloon versus a DCB. As far as stenting goes, you know, um, with the tack, tackated stents have been very beneficial now to just tack up anything that you may feel like there's a, an area that, you know, may, may not, may have some restenosis. Um, but for the most part, I, you know, I feel very comfortable if you can great, get a standalone, uh, you know, result. Glenn, when you, uh, uh, when you are doing atherectomy, any kind of directional atherectomy, and you run into wire wrap, how do you deal with that? Uh, best way to deal with it is not do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I, I have a routine of when I start to cut, I'll initially go clockwise. I just start doing that. If, even if I'm looking around, I go clockwise. And so once I get to about the six or eight o'clock position, I'll go back the other way. If I see some plaque at like the nine o'clock position that I need to get there, Rather than continue to wrap around, I'll go the other way. Um, the thing, when you get lost in these long CTOs, it sometimes makes it difficult to remember where you are. And if I have any suspicion whatsoever, 
before I try to start pulling the catheter back, I'll look up at the sheath and see what the wire looks like at the sheath because that's the area where it's going to elbow and that's what's gonna create the problem with extracting the, the catheter over the guide wire. Um, so I, I make sure that, that if there's any question about that, um, one of the things, and one of the reasons I use that torque tool to, to maintain the, the position of the filter wire is, I've had occasion when I've tried to push the catheter through a heavily calcified lesion, that if I didn't have the filter wire maintained uh, in position against the sheath, the filter wire would tend to elbow down. And then that creates another potential problem with extracting, because then you have a bow or an, a, a kink in the wire which is going to make it difficult to get the catheter off of it. Yeah. Um, and me so, personally, you know, it's, uh, I don't really pay attention much how many times I've gone, just because like you said, you just kind of get caught up in the procedure. Um, usually I have that feel of, you know, what I usually do is hold the wire, I pull the catheter back until I get any level of resistance. Once I get level of resistance, I look down and that's where I start to unwrap. Usually when I've gotten into an issue with, um, <laughs> Uh, wire wrap it's usually when uh, the fellow is guiding it and you know I'm not paying attention I'm doing something else they pull back they feel like they're right at the uh, the sheath tip and so they keep pulling once you keep pulling that's where you kink that wire so right. I think you're right you know prevent <clears throat> and trying to do that but then just that uh, understanding of if you feel any level of resistance because it should be so smooth and it really this is inherent to any directional atherectomy device or anything that has a monorail system to it um, a question came in when crossing a total occlusion with ocelot or uh, or performing atherectomy do you use the information that you see with oct to guide your adjunctive therapy so for example do you use a stent or no stent glenn yeah, so if, if I know that I've gone subintimal in a portion of it, either with the ocelot or looking at the pantheris, and I can see that, I'm, that I, there was an area where I was close to the adventitia, then I'll, I'll either stent that or I'll use a DCB. And, it, and to Ian's point, that usually occurs at the distal cap. That's the most common place for, for it to happen. Um, so absolutely, I use the feedback from the imaging to help guide therapy. And to his point, if, I, if I've made the passes with the device and I see that I've removed plaque, I haven't damaged the media, and I take a picture, I, I'm good. I, I don't usually use a DCB unless I think there's some reason to use the DCB. And, and I think one of the advantages of using these devices is angiography is going to be very, mis it's not going to be representative because it's a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional structure. And the only way that I feel I get a true representation of the disease burden that's there is by using the OCT imaging to know where to cut and to know the, the, the lay of the land, basically. Um, a question by Dr. Uh, Davis. Do you think the guys think that using ocelot has changed your restenosis rates? And if so, how much? Obviously, anecdotal reports, but what are your thoughts? Oh, I absolutely think it's, it's changing because I haven't, I haven't had to use it much in the way of stents. And so I don't have to worry about in, in stent restenosis. Um, and because it's kept me in the central portion of the artery where I don't have to worry about the potential of just what we've talked about all, all hour long, uh, the results of neoendome hyperplasia in subadventitial uh, position. There, there's a couple of studies out there, one by, the, by Dr. Davis and a Japanese study that showed that luminal to luminal crossing is, does decrease the restenosis rate. And so that's always been the, the big dogma is does crossing lumen to lumen, you know, normal to normal, does that make a difference? Or is going subintimal and reentering, does that, you know, how much more restenosis is there? So I do think that, you know, there's probably more study that, studying that needs to be done. But we do have two pretty good papers, you know, both one again, about one by Dr. Davis, that show that, you know, this actually, you know, makes a difference. Um, so I know the, from that uh, standpoint. the central study by Tom Davis is one of the landmark studies, exactly what you said, showing that true lumen crossing improves patency. So it's really important. Um, I think that's it uh, from a question standpoint. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. So uh, a couple more people I want to thank. Boots on the ground, Greg Trailer. 
helping out Ian, um, getting everything set up, and and uh, Brad Furman, Glenn's uh, rep, uh, working with him. A lot of people have uh, put a lot of effort into this, and really appreciate everyone, especially uh, Glenn and Ian, being on this call. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Could we go to the next slide? And hopefully this was informative. Um, we're going to continue this. Brad, do you mind just go, or Glenn, could you go to the next slide? So um, we're going to continue the webinar uh, series. We've gotten such great responses to this. Um, the next uh, webinar is going to be understanding OCT image interpretation and how it correlates to plaque morphology. I'm going to take that on next time. Um, we have a great internal pathologist that goes through uh, a lot of these plaques and I'm sure you guys have sent in your plaque and just to be able to go through and, and see you know what is what are the the different characteristics that we see in OCT because that resolution is so much higher you can see lipid pools necrot necrotic pores calcium adventitia media EEL so going through that we're gonna go through OCT uh, dedicate one uh, to OCT guiding uh, therapy and um, if you guys have any other suggestions we would love to hear that. You can uh, email us at contact.avenger.com. Glenn has been gracious enough to give us um, ability to communicate with him as well, either by email or his cell phone, if you want to run any cases by him. Uh, but again, thank you everyone for being on this call. We really appreciate it.